the States, we came out with five megatrends. And um, one of them was increased amounts of sustainability, long-term stuff. And I started reading it. It's like I decided that everybody talks about sustainability, but at some point, roll up your sleeves and do it. You remember one of the signs that was last year uh, on the Yale Family campus about, and one of the signs was the biggest danger is believing somebody else will solve it. At some point, you got to roll up our sleeves and say, "Where am I going? What am I going to do? I can't solve the whole world, but what can I do?" About three, four years ago, Trina came up with some research on who actually will spend money on a sustainable house, and not just say it's nice. Um, and. And we asked these three people, one of them got the house, but we asked all three, why? You know, why this house? I'm delighted, there's a lot of houses out there. And all of them had the same answer. They're really pretty. That's it? I mean, kill myself to do all this other stuff, you buckles, it's pretty? I said, yeah. And so when I started learning about sustainability, it's more than survival. Heating and cooling finds nice, but if you're miserable, if it's ugly, I gotta wake up in the morning and say, yeah, this is a place I wanna be. And so initially that was pretty crushing. People got it because it was pretty and we spent all this money on consultants to make sure we do all these things. They didn't believe us when we showed them our utility bills. Look, energy bill, zero. Zero. When looking at water, we're gonna say, how much water does the house need? Potable and non-potable. And the other is, how long might you go between rain. Like when we moved here, there was a couple times when it was like seven weeks between rains. So remember 100% plus storage. So we have a cistern, when it rains, the water goes into the cistern, which is storage, and then you bring it back. Okay, so let's well, talk about have... that. It comes off the roof, goes into the downspouts. Downspouts don't go out into the land. We pull them all together and it runs into a cistern. Yeah, so you got to, it comes out a downspout into a pipe into the cistern. It's basically just a box in the ground. And the first ones we did, I think, were 3,200 gallons. System in the house. So one set of pipes is for non-potable use, for toilets, hose bibs, that kind of stuff, which is the bulk of water in most houses. And then the other is potable use, which is the sinks, the washer, the dishwasher. The... Well, how do you make sure that the water you want to drink has no chemicals in it? Reverse osmosis. Every house standard has an RO filter at the kitchen sink. And it hooks over to the refrigerator. So if you guys want a good thing of water, the refrigerator. The first four houses are on sewer and water, city sewer, city water, for the potable water. And the last three, first four houses, the last three houses are off city water. So we use called closed loop geothermal. We have pipes that go into the ground and this is like we'll start in mid-December roughly until end of February, about two and a half months. Um, they're outside, they're pipes that go down on the ground and so let's say it's 20 degrees outside. So they take the 20 degrees and transfer it to fluid. Fluid is going down but now all of a sudden it's giving off its coldness, picking up heat from the earth. And so after it goes down and up and down in these pipes, it comes back into the house, and now it might be, you know, 60 degrees. I mean, it, it's, it's warm. It's a lot warmer. And, and so that's, it's called, so that's the reverse of it, from cooling. And you can do it for heating also. And so we have a device called an energy recovery ventilator, and it's in the attic of the garage. You can't even see it, but and we'll turn it on in the wintertime. And what happens if the, if the temperature, if the relative humidity gets up to a certain amount, it takes the indoor air, sends it out one pipe, and, and brings in fresh air from outside that's lower humidity without losing your heat. The technical term for this space is called the heat sink. Sun comes in, heats it, right? Floor is absorbing all this nice heat. <clears throat> We're sitting here, and what are we exhaling? Carbon dioxide. And what do we need? We need oxygen. So we need a device that can generate oxygen and absorb carbon dioxide. And the device is called a leaf. <laughs> and he said, your carbon dioxide is a lot lower than outside air. And you got five kilowatts. So we make the house very efficient, but then in order to, you know, we still have a lot of electrical usage, 
So the solar panels create that, that for us. They're all on the roof. And then the other thing we have is solar water heater so that um, your water will get heated. Some of these specialists, architects that did passive solar design, passive, by the way, means that the building is the collector. So in a sense, these big skylights you're seeing, those perfect 90 degrees of the winter sun. See, he comes those, it's the furnace. Heats the house and we keep it in the house. And so I can get into details. One of the things also about aesthetics is that it isn't just for Earth. And Mother Earth, right? Mm -hmm. Gaia, that's, that's, if we do all the stuff that makes it better for Earth. But how about for us? So it's not a win-lose, it's gotta be a win-win. The other thing we learned was community is um, we, we consciously made it so that the cars are on the outside and inside is for walking. Pedestrians. But what happens is when you walk and you, you bump up against other people, you talk to them, you get to know them. And there was one time where we were in a homeowners meeting and we said, what is it about this place that you just love? And it was like, we know everybody. And all, everybody knows everybody. And they sh we share tools, we share, you know, ideas, we share, you know, it's, um, we're comfortable with, the, with, with each other and we would support anybody that asked for help. And it was really important that the building of community is such an important component of, to the me, term, yeah. sustainability. We put in what's called conservation zoning. So everybody owns their own home, but you also own a seventh, because seven houses, you own a seventh of the shared space. So, so conservation zoning is you can put the houses closer together, but then you put a certain amount of land in forever in protection and that's what we wanted to do and that's what we the other thing that we have here is we do have a small garden it's not uh, vegetable gardens and on saturday mornings in the summers we have what's called market time so everybody comes in and can get whatever's harvested that day and um, so again people get to know each other rub elbows talk all that kind of stuff and so we need to be net zero on food which we, we don't have the land here to do it. But I am gonna guarantee that you'll always have, regardless of what happens on planet Earth, you will have a full array of organic, healthful food on site. And blacktop is toxic. We have no blacktop on the site. Everything soaks in, so we don't put stuff out into the street. Some of it is the land use. So we put things closer together, so you use less piping between things and less roads and all that kind of stuff. We use permeable surfaces so that ev and everything is terraced so that you don't get massive puddling. The land use is different than what had traditionally been done in this area. This one is seven homes, the next one would be 68 homes, plus an inn. So we're in the process of looking, um, we're actually looking in the Richmond area right now to see if there's some land available and a way to do it and regulations that'll support us and all that kind of stuff.